now. And then Brian, I will let you take it away. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, my name is Brian Campbell. I'm the director for the Bureau of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction at PDE. Um, this is, I've been there a little over four years now. Yep, 2016. So a little over four years. Um, I work directly under uh, Deputy Secretary STEM in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, and, you know, all the things you would think of curriculum assessment instruction, the content uh, advisors are in our division, um, federal programs, all those good things. So, um, yeah, happy to be here. Um, I did not plan a, a long presentation. I really wanted to, to do as much Q&A as possible. Um, to mention, though, I think the one thing I do want to mention, it, um, to not to take up a lot of time, but when we talk about resources and things that were that are going to be released uh, to to support schools and things like that, uh, we're working right now. In fact, yesterday, uh, my division worked with a lot of our IU partners. Um, probably Brooke, I know, has been on several of these uh, calls as we push out the the roadmap. Um, the, the kind of shortcut name for it, if you've seen uh, the roadmap for it, it's got a long name, uh, Equitable Opening Safe Schools. There's lots of words in there, but um, it's, it's been a really helpful tool. And I think, I hope everyone finds it a really helpful resource um, as we work through it with the IU partners. Um, what we've done is, as we've taken, you know, a lot of the, the offices, there's an assessment instruction page, there's a safe schools page, um, there's a social emotional learning page. And we've tried to, it, it's not a lot of new things. What we've tried to do is, is gather a lot of best resources, um, best practices, a lot of tools we have, and do two things. One is, is put them in one spot and say, here's some priority tools. And the second thing we've tried to do is link them together a little bit. Um, we know that, that uh, the, the teachers planning time and, and faculty meeting time and professional development time and all the things that you didn't have enough of anyway, um, you now have redirected, you know, in a lot of other, and, and they're very meaningful things. It's, it's safety and, and um, you know, health and the, the safe day-to-day uh, -day operations because of the, uh, the pandemic. So just to try, to try to focus folks into one spot uh, where a lot of these things are linked. Um, and you'll find some really good resources there, you know, attendance, engagement, um, uh, a lot of things that are applicable. Like I said, no matter what delivery mode you're in, um, if you're in a situation where you transition delivery modes, I mean, hopefully it's a, it's a situation where you've transferred, uh, you know, been less restrictive and got to move back into the building. But, you know, with, with upcoming conditions, we may have folks that are, that are moving backwards on that continuum too. Uh, and there's really uh, resources on there for, for any mode of delivery um, to, to kind of tie that all together and, and just make it convenient. I'll speak quickly to the assessment, the instruction and assessment uh, page. And if you see it, it, literally it's a great little graphic that shows a road like a highway and there are some plus sign shaped dots and there's one for kind of each, uh, each division. Uh, what you'll find in the instruction, uh, assessment instruction one, uh, we really focused on, on tools to look at, um, you know, learning gaps and, and um, you know, what impact the, the, any loss of instruction time throughout the pandemic, anywhere from March till present day uh, has had. So there's a lot of uh, resources as far as testing, you know, assessment creator, uh, CDTs. Um, there are supports for all level of CDTs, including you can get started and enrolled right off that website. You can train folks right off that website. Or if you're deep into the CDTs, you can, you can um, find out which reports to use uh, in certain situations and how to read certain reports. I mean, it's all right there. Um, we also have some protocols and some, some charts to help you organize data meetings if you have data teams and to really look at that data effectively. And then we tie that to some priority content. So we took the standards and grouped them so that if you've got a group of students, you know, and, and this honestly will help with, with not just remediation, but also um, any acceleration you need to do, it's gonna help your on-grade kids. 
But when you, uh, you know, benchmark or you do a diagnostic and you've got some differentiation needed because you've been in different levels of, of um, you know, interruption during the school year, um, you can find those standard numbers and then find, you know, appropriate content that helps you kind of take take on chunks of those standards at a time so that you can create some priority assignments uh, and some prioritized work, um, you know, to move kids where you need them to go. Uh, so hopefully all of that in one spot, like I said, can help folks maximize planning time or group teaming time or department meeting time and things like that. Um, we're right now training our staff and the IU staff uh, through, they've carried the, uh, They've carried the roadmap into we now have pit stops on the roadmap. So we had a pit stop yesterday uh, where we work with those folks to, to be able to turn that around and, and assist you. You could log on to it right now and get a lot out of it. Um, but I do think eventually, uh, you know, when, when Brooke and, and Rebecca and other folks are able to really sit with you when you have a question, I think you're going to find there's a lot there, a lot of really helpful stuff. Um, and please feel free to uh, feedback. Um, Brooke has my, my email, and if this doesn't somehow give it to you, I, I have no problem giving you guys my email and my desk phone uh, so you don't have to wait in line. Um, if you've got you know, useful feedback, positive or negative, about that or any of the other resources, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly anytime on that because um, you know, we want that stuff to be beneficial and support folks. In fact, I think I see it on your bulletin board uh, right behind <laughs> you there. Um, so that's good. That's the, big, all. the big plan, Brian. That's our think board right there. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That is a yeah. lot of thinking. You guys are doing a great job. So, uh, I, and I knew you would work with Brooke a lot and, and Brooke does a great job. So folks are in a, lucky to be in the spot you're in. Thank you. Uh, I did drop in the chat there, direct links out to the website. Um, we did at our last curriculum council meeting, just preview because just prior to that, um, the high level focus uh, documents were added to the roadmap. So, and then we did mention that we had a little bit of a deeper dive yesterday. You know, generally when, when we're kind of providing the narrative for how to use those, uh, there's lots of questions that come up with, you know, well, what about eligible content? And we just got that letter that the test assessments are still happening in the spring. And, and we keep underscoring that this does not replace eligible content in any way. The assessment continues to be aligned to, to eligible content, but this is for, for teachers who have to make really tough calls on instructional time and instructional uh, yep. priorities this year. Um, and you know when it's uh, a four week poetry unit, because I just love figurative language, You know, is that really the best use of our time or am I diving into opportunities where kids can continue to you know, read rigorous text and, and compare um, you know, text and, and do cross text analysis and, and all of that, you know, is that where my instructional time should continue to build those foundational skills rather than loading maybe some more um, ancillary content on top of an already, you know, rich year. So yep. uh, we and just were talking about keeping those instructional priorities attached to those things that really have connective tissue to the next grade level um, and doubling down on, on that instructional time. Yeah, and that's perfectly put. That that is exactly how the tool is built. Um, you know, it's they're not. Uh, I, I think at one point there was some some documentation put out. You know, uh, from USDE that talked about priority standards. They're all a priority. The, the standards themselves are the priority, but the content can be focused. You can pick uh, assignments or or units or things to to you know be a little colloquial, you get the most bang for your buck. That, that's really what it's about. Um, because you are gonna have uh, limited uh, or, or at least different formats to your instructional time than what your used, teachers are used to having. And like I said, they have a different format to their planning time. So making this compact, making it available, making it easy to understand and use. And, and um, you know, like I said, also very cyclical. In the past, you would have gone out to a CDT site you would have gone to, you know, your IU to get get that data process. You'd have gone to as to the SAS website to pull down the standards. It's it's there. It's all there, and the links kind of continually move you around through it. Um, and it's important to know that that while CDTs and uh, Assessment Builder are, are kind of emphasized on there, um, it's because they're free. I mean, those are the PD free resources, so we certainly want to make those available. Um, nothing on there would be exclusive to those. 
So all of the data analysis charts or tools, um, you know, stars, maps, study islands, uh, some of the, the big things that I know, um, products that folks use out there uh, and feedback I've gotten, uh, nothing's exclusive to those. So you don't have to rebuild a program if you've got something that really works for you, even if it's teacher made or, or you know, driven by your textbook series. Um, anything's, anything is adaptable. That's, that's part of what that tool does for you, that the uh, data protocol tool. Um, so it makes, you know, if, if you want to really start a system and you, this is your, your, you know, gateway into CDT and really getting, getting into the reports that tie right to the, to the eligible content, like Brooke said, that's great. If you're really comfortable with, you know, something you've got set up stars or maps or whatever, and you just need this to, to save you that instructional time and save you that planning time, it's going to work that way for you too. Thank you. Does anyone, do any of you have any questions? And, and Kaylin, if you want to put it in the chat too, I know your microphone doesn't work, but if you want to put it in the chat, you're more than welcome to. So, or anyone can unmute themselves. Yeah. Brian, is the assessment builder um, updated from, I guess it, it was released about five years ago. Have they done updates? I remember yesterday on the session, they talked about that. Um, but can you explain some of the updates that took place? Sure. So they have, so there's two, there is, there has been updated um, item banks uh, because that is, it is a limited pool at, at some point, obviously. Um, so there has been one and we have on the docket to do that again. Um, one of the things that will slow that down just a little bit is the fact that we update that with used test items and we're reusing a test. Now, we're more than one year behind. So it, we're using you know, items probably from around uh, the 1718 uh, test at this point. Um, but it is important to know that because we reused a test this year, we went one full year uh, cycle without generating new items. Uh, but we are gonna replenish the item banks or, or um, we just add to them, we don't pull out just so they get deeper. Uh, and we also upgraded a, a feature. Um, if you haven't been in assessment builder since, and this happened um, late spring. So, so if you haven't been in, you know, since uh, some of the mitigation efforts and things began, um, it's very much like, and I'm going to blank a little bit on the app names. I think it's, it's, is it Quibi and Quizlet and some of those things where you can kind of do the poll on your phone or if you've got a smart board set up or, or you've got a technology thing where you can shoot out an item and, and kids kind of in real time can uh, get some, you can get some feedback, a ticket out the door situation or a quick informal assessment. Um, you can now do that. So you can do that with your own created items um, uh, right out of the assessment builder. So you could create the item or if you very quickly want to say, okay, I want to, you know, whichever standard reading independently, you know, at the, eligible content and type that little number, you know, at the third grade level or, you know, eighth grade level or whatever, it'll pop out a question real quick and you can shoot that out through technology. So um, it now has that same functionality as a lot of those apps that, that we use. So that's kind of a new feature. Um, and they've uh, kind of enhanced the look of, I mean, SAS kind of went under a facelift last, beginning of last year, I think, um, where you can, uh, save your created assessments um, and some of those things. There's a lot more, um, you can mix now more easily teacher created items with downloaded items. You used to either be able to create or upload one of your unit tests or download a, an assessment creator test. And you can keep those all in your same folder and organize yourself, but you can now literally mix and match those items. So, you know, you really want to concentrate on something you hit in class or a piece of maybe literature you hit in class, you could do that, um, you know, from your, from your uh, resource materials or just off the top of your head, however you design your own tests. And maybe that's the first eight or 10 questions. And then you say, okay, and I'm going to build on that figurative language idea. Here's three poems you haven't read. I'm going to download ones though from past items and you can download them and drop them right in there and save that assessment. So you can mix and match those items when you create assessments now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it, if any of you are interested, um, 
possibly in having one of like the assessment builder as an online learning hub feature, please reach out to us and, and we can connect with PDE and, and they can do a, a run through with us um, yeah, now that absolutely. it has had the facelift. So, yeah. yep, absolutely. Our folks will do that. Um, one of the other uses too, I think I know a lot of times in the district, um, again, some of the, it, it creates the test pretty quickly. It gives you an answer key. Um, the math one's not only the answer key works out the problem and things like that. So if you've got, you know, um, kid moves in from a from another state and and you're looking at where their course placement is because maybe their their scope and sequence is a little different, their titles are a little different. Um, you've got a kid that you know wants to, um, you know, skip a grade or skip a course and things like that. Um, a lot of those kind of things you can pull down. You know, you could make a. a, a 30 question quiz and hit X number of math standards and things. So there's a lot you can do if you want to quickly tie, tie uh, an assessment to the anchors and eligible content and the standards without you having to make something and then crosswalk it out. Um, you can feel a little more confident if you are using it in you know, a, a special ed setting or a placement setting or a thing like that because it's instantly aligned. Awesome. Brian, so I have uh, I'm just kind of recapping some of the conversations I've had in the last couple of days with principals. Um, and even among our team as we're, we're moving forward with thinking about the roadmap, right? And how can we use resources from the roadmap for continuous school improvement, whether it's pandemic reentry, right? And sometimes I think like, oh, I wish I would have had this two months ago. But, you know, but at the same time, we still have kids showing up on our roster. Absolutely. You know, in the school yesterday that just are transitioning back from remote or you know we still have a large contingent based on parents not being able to do the hybrid schedule or for whatever reason that'll eventually you know fingers crossed move back into you know the, the classroom setting so how can we kind of move away from that misconception of we miss the mark in yeah. using these source these you know resources in September versus really using them to continue to support these transitions in the next nine to 12 months. Yep. And, and I agree, Brooke, I, we wish we had them to you four months ago. I, I don't disagree. Unfortunately, this is something, you know, as this evolves, we, we built from scratch. No one was sitting around thinking, you know, we should have this in case we close schools for an entire year, because that just wasn't, wasn't something I thought I was going to see or anyone was going to see. And just like everyone else, you know, everyone's attention is diverted five different ways. Um, everyone's initial reaction, uh, you know, as a state level education agency, but uh, much, much more so all of you as principals and, and your superintendents and your uh, central office folks, we had to get the doors open, you know, safely. We had to, to come up with plans. It was important for parents to know that it was okay to, to, get their kid in a building or that if their kid couldn't get in the building that we were going to provide them, you know, education. And, you know, a lot of what we did last year, I think from, from March, you know, at, at the end was to say, okay, we've got to hold our ground. We, this was unexpected. This is an emergency situation. And that was kind of that continuity of ed idea. You know, this year was starting a school year in a completely potentially in a completely different learning model than you've ever, you know, ever really used and then that your uh, constituents were used to. So would this have been a great planning tool over the summer and you'd have had so much more time? Absolutely. I, there's, I don't think anyone would argue with you. Um, except that, like I, like I said, I think, um, I think everyone's time to do anything over the summer was limited because you were training your teachers on how to use Seesaw and Zoom and, you know, the 8,000 canvas and the 8,000 other things we have to do now that we never did before. So you're right. Um, it, it's really about, you know, moving forward, no matter what um, pandemic year or not, there were, there's learning gaps among your kids. We know that, you know, one of the big moves we made when we switched from, from, um, you know, SPP and some of the, the formal federal designations um, we use the ESSA plan as an opportunity when, when we expanded ed indicators out to the, sub, um, to the subgroup level, to the student group level, there, there are learning gaps that exist all the time. Uh, they exist you know, within every school. 
in every mode of delivery and every subject for a variety of different reasons. So I think the important thing here is, um, I feel like a lot of times differentiation and differentiated instruction was this magic word. Um, it was a little bit like Bigfoot. Everyone could tell me about it, but no one really showed it to me. Like if I said, oh, good, show me the best way to differentiate this and laid it down in front of folks, people would hem and haw and, and give me a lot of theoretical talk. And sometimes I'd wonder, eh, I'm not sure. Um, this is what I hope, hope you can do with this now. You know, you can at any point give a 10 question benchmark and, and um, you know, the ideas that are good ideas were good ideas before the pandemic. They've just become crucial because we lack time and we lack resources. Flexible grouping was always a good idea. Benchmarking and, and, and diagnostic testing were always good ideas. Um, you know, some of those things are, are applicable no matter what. We just have to we have to apply them now because we're in a, in a weird situation in an unusual situation. Um, I think if anything else too, you know, just the concept of going back over assessment literacy and, and good curriculum design, it's, you know, your best teacher is even if, if, if they're, you know, a relatively new teacher, it's probably three, four years removed from their ed weights and measures class and things like that. You know, do you, do you really remember when to use the diagnostic and what the diagnostic show, shows you and when to use the benchmark and what the benchmark shows you and which one of the two is the better way to flex, you know, to regroup the kids and things. Th this will do a lot of that for you. And I think that's really valuable. I think, I think the assessment literacy piece um, and it's no one's fault. I mean, no one has, no one's going back and reading their college textbooks in the middle of the school year, whether we had a pandemic or not. Um, so I think this is a really good place uh, to, to reinforce some of those ideas that you would have burned a professional development day and, and it would have had to be a sit and get and you hope it's stuck um, in this website. So assessing kids that move in and out, assessing kids, again, if you have to transition modes either way, you're bringing more kids in or you, or you end up more remote. Um, you know, at the end of units, looking at flexible grouping as you, as you kind of change courses and things, especially if you're a semester kind of school or on a, on a rotational schedule in a middle school or something like that. I think all those things are still good uses. And we are, we are going to update, like, this is not just a pandemic resource. The pandemic forced us to build the resource more quickly than, than we had on our radar, than on our project list. Um, but, but Brian Gasper, who's the, uh, chief for instructional quality and I have already talked about, we already have some things going out and some, some ways we want to expand this. Um, like I said, it's a collection of good ideas. You can always use a collection of good ideas. Right. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I noticed a, a comment in the chat that really brings the sentiment of, you know, we're, we're building the airplane while we're flying it. We're trying to implement different forms of diagnostic and because we need to really get a, a sense for where the kids are. You know, they're kind of living, finding a way to live in this chaos, right? Um, and some building administrators have the mindset right now of it's a year of survival. Yep. And I'll look down the road later. And then there's others that are like, nope, we still need to look down the line. I still had the, the goals of where we were going to be with certain initiatives this year. You know, I've got my eye on computer science. I've got my eye on these new you know, science standards that are, that are potentially, you know, getting passed within the next 18 months, like how, what would your recommendation on finding and striking the balance between survival and being planful? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. And we just have had these um, discussions, not just around the roadmap, but how we're going to approach accountability and the potential accountability waivers and a few things like that. I think if I could be real candid, and this is, this is going to be uh, Brian Campbell's opinion, but I think the most dangerous thing, and we've talked about this a lot amongst ourselves, is assumptions. Mm -hmm. I think we make a lot of assumptions. What did work, what didn't work. Um, we have to be three months off because we missed three months of the end of the year last year. I'm not, I'm not certain that's true. I think there are kids that are three months behind. I think there are kids that are farther ahead than you, you think. And I think there are kids that are much farther behind than that and would have been if you'd have stayed in school for every minute of that year. So a lot of what we have to do with data now, whether it's data like these benchmarks that I think it's, it's 
you know, it's things that, that people want to incorporate into the school day or whether it's the data that it looks like we're going to be forced to gather, you know, by the, by the USDE. Um, the purpose of having it is to not make, make assumptions and to get, to get things contextualized. You have to survive this year, and I, everyone's first uh, first priority is going to be health and safety. There's there's no doubt, and it should be. This year cannot look like a normal school year. It, it, no one expects it, um, and anyone who do does is is fooling themselves, and you can't please them. So I, I wouldn't try too hard. The one danger I will will continually put out from a curriculum sense, okay, um, is if you moved your curriculum if you said okay well i missed three months last year so i've got to reteach three months at the beginning of this year and then try to catch up a kindergartner this year will be off your scope and sequence for 12 years additionally once things get back to normal you'll have a whole group of kids behind him that are back on scope and sequence you cannot run effectively it, this isn't a resource problem or, or anything. This is, a, this is an education science problem. You can't effectively run two continuous scope and sequences and move everyone through. So that's why I think these are good tools. And regardless of whether I want you know, assessment data at the end of the year, if we have some, and some of these other things, those are the decisions. That's why I think the assumptions can really hurt you. If you hold every kid back three months exactly because you missed three months of school and you don't assess, differentiate, use some, use some different tools, use some different learning modes, um, you know, potentially you're, you're off schedule for 12 years and none of us can, you know, none of us can afford to be off schedule for 12 years. That's just not, not feasible. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, we want to thank you, Brian, for your time. Four o'clock comes so fast in these after hours. Um, yeah, we will send this out um, and send it out to all the registrants and house it on our website for people to check out later. So thank you again. Um, if you guys need email addresses for him, um, yes. feel yep. free to reach out to Brooke or myself and we can put yep. you in contact. But thank you for joining us today. Thank and you. Absolutely. My pleasure.